Okay, so we are going to be looking at the Sabbath school lesson for this week, which is entitled The Foundation of God's Government. The Foundation of God's Government. Uh, it's kind of an interesting picture they have uh, connected with the lesson here today, where we have uh, a depiction of the cross. Um, and then we also have, it's as if he's standing on the Ark of the Covenant on the mercy seat. Um, connecting the, the, the altar of burnt offering in the courtyard with the Ark of the Covenant in the most holy place, which is a, an interesting thought. Um, and, uh, of course, there's also a, a little depiction in the background that kind of looks like the shadowing forth of the Ten Commandments, which is also interesting the way they have it depicted. Um, the law being a shadow, ultimately, of the substance, which is Christ himself. Christ especially Christ on the cross, revealing the ultimate substance of, of God's law of uh, self-sacrificial love. So our, uh, the lesson, again, entitled The Foundation of God's Government. So what is the foundation of God's government? Has anybody studied the lesson yet this week? Okay, well, um, the Sabbath School lessons this week are going through the book, The Great Controversy. The last week was on the sanctuary, um, where we have the chapters, what is the sanctuary, and then the Holy of Holies in the book, The Great Controversy, and then what follows right after is uh, the, cha the chapter, God's Law Immutable. God's Law Immutable. And so here, Sunday's lessons entitled The Sanctuary and the Law. And then Monday, The immutabil Immutability of God's Law. Tuesday is The Sabbath and the Law. Wednesday is On the Mark of the Beast. Thursday is on the three angels' messages. And of course, we have our closing thoughts. Just to see topically what the subject matter is for the lesson. Now, uh, it's a lot of material. We couldn't possibly cover it all in, in the time that we have to study it together. Um, so I wanted to talk about some, some of the key things and, and, uh, some of the most interesting points, you know, important points that I think merit some discussion. So the lesson is in, is, is offering almost implicitly that the foundation of God's government is the law. And so, why why is that? Why why would the law be the foundation of God's government? Being a Sabbath school lesson, I'm looking for participation in this movement. Without law, doesn't there's chaos, isn't there? So you have to have laws. Okay. So the idea that without law, there really isn't a government. Right. Okay. Any other thoughts? About the law being the foundation of God's government. The law is based on the character of God. Um, okay. His law is based on... Um, his character. So 
unlike the laws we see today, although they have their foundation at some point in history in the law of God, our justice system and other such laws, God's law, if you look at it from the standpoint of his righteousness, then his law is in fact 10 promises if you if we are depending on him to give us the strength and the wherewithal we need to follow his law then his law is essentially 10 promises not necessarily even 10 do's and don'ts because apart from him we can't follow his law his moral law is based on his righteousness, his character, because we have none of our own. Hence, we see Joshua, the high priest, an example in Zechariah 3, standing before the throne of God with filthy garments, Satan arguing how bad he is, and God, as advocate and judge, both arguing in his behalf. As an example, Jesus argues in our behalf, saying that according to his righteousness, it is possible to keep the Ten Commandments in our own strength, but in his, his strength is made perfect in our weakness. So instead of ten admonitions, which still are, but not according to our own strength, it's, it's you know, he he's reminding us that we love him because he loved us first by saying, I am the Lord thy God that have brought thee out of the house of Egypt, out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. I'm promising you that if you follow me and stick close to me and lean upon me with all your strength, with all your finite strength, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not bow thyself down to them nor serve them. You shall not make unto thyself any graven image of anything which is in the heaven above and the earth below or in the water underneath the earth. We will have the strength to do all of that and so on and so forth. Amen. Let's consider the idea that the law is a transcript of his character. I agree that's yeah. true. So if you have the character of God... And on in in one side in one in one hand, as it were, you've got the character of God. It's the most perfect character of unselfish love. And then you've got a written transcript of that character in your other hand. Which is the, which is more important, the the written transcript of the character or the one who actually has that character? Well, the one that actually has the character, but it helps to have the written transcript. It certainly does, because you don't find that anywhere else. Oh, I, I, I'm not disagreeing that it helps. Uh, Imagine, I, would, I wouldn't I have mean, known sin except by the law, right? Is that what Paul tells us? But certainly the law written within our hearts is equally important, if not more. Okay, and how does that law get written in our hearts? That law gets written in our hearts according to the Holy Spirit as we hunger and thirst after righteousness and are filled with his character. Okay, so the one who has that character is the one who writes it in our hearts. Amen. Make Again, making the one who has that character more important. Yes. It's, it's not demoting the importance of the law. <laughs> Um, it's God's law. Uh, we're, not, we're not doing away with God's law. But we want to see the law actually points us to Christ. It's, mm -hmm. Christ is the substance <laughs> of the law, as it were. Even though, in another sense, the, exactly. law, the law is not shadowy in the sense that it's always been because God has always been. And his character of love has always been. So it's not shadowy. And Christ is God. And, and yet it is. Christ is just a. Go ahead. Yes, Christ is God. That's right. Christ is the physical manifestation of his character. God manifest in the flesh, the scripture tells us. Uh huh. Yeah, so, I, amen. Yes. <clears throat> so we 
have to uh, consider uh, uh, Christ. I think that we, you know, well, it was said of our Advent pioneers uh, under inspiration that they preached the law of the law until the hill, they were as dry as the hills of Gilboa. And they had lost sight of Christ. That's what 1888 was about, was about making Christ back to be central. To see Christ, to see Christ in the law, and mm -hmm. that's the foundation of God's government. Christ is the foundation of God's government. Uh, the written transcript of Christ is not the foundation of His government. The, it's yeah. I mean, God, God could have said to Peter, "You are the rock, the the foundation." He wasn't actually saying to Peter that he was the rock. He was saying that. Christ was the rock. He could have very easily said the Ten Commandment law is the rock, but without Christ, how can we possibly aspire to such a height, you know? Amen. So we want the right balance. And we want to, our yeah. emphasis needs to be on Christ. So mm -hmm. we have the sanctuary last week, and then we have, we have the law this week. You know, in Jeremiah 17, 12, Jeremiah 17, 12, it tells us a glorious high throne from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. Very interesting thought. A glorious high throne from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. So in the sanctuary is a glorious high throne from the beginning. It's always been, and this is talking about the heavenly sanctuary there's a glorious high throne what 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 does a throne imply that god is supreme that that he is um our all in all amen who sits he on a throne the, conduit, but... the king he's the conduit amen the king the king sits on the throne and yeah. and what is the law in a kingdom? What is the law in the kingdom? The king's whatever, law. whatever king, whatever kingdom you're in, what is the law? How do you know what the law is if you're in a, if you're living in a kingdom? It's what the king decides. It's, it's whatever the king says. That's right. The word of the king is law. And the word of our heavenly king is law. It's his word. That's Christ is the word, by the way. <laughs> That's the law. That's why he is the law. That's why the law is a transcript of his character, because he is the word of God. That's speaking with authority. He's the lawgiver. Uh, I didn't think of that verse, but that's a good one. In Isaiah 33... 22, I think, Isaiah 33, yes, 22. For the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king, he will save us. Hmm. So we have a law, and the law is, is a foundation, can be thought of as a foundation of his government. But there's one who's actually the lawgiver, who made the law. <laughs> Who gave the law. He didn't really make the law. He gave the law because it was himself. It was, it's, it describes who he is. His character of unselfish love. He couldn't, he couldn't do otherwise because that's who he is. And he has a right to make the law because he's the king. By the way, because he's the king and he has a right to make the law, he's also the one that has the only right to judge the law. That's why he's our judge, he's our lawgiver, he's our king. And praise the Lord, he's also the one who will save us. So yes, the law helps us to understand better about God's character 
because we're so far from his character because of sin. But we want a relationship with Christ. He's the one who will save us. The law is not going to save us. The law only tells me what sin is. as Paul tells us. But Christ is the one who saves us. Christ is the foundation of the government. And then we might say, I would say, and it's better said that, that the law is actually the foundation of his justice. That the written law was actually established because God was, was establishing a systematized process of judgment to accomplish the atonement. Um, and so, like we find in this world, if you're, if you're going to judgment, would you prefer to have a law that's declared or would you have, would you like a law that's in writing as the basis of your judgment? Declared. Well, I, I would like, I mean, if I was going to a, an earthly court, I'd want to live somewhere where the basis of the proceedings was based on a law that was written down that everybody knew in advance. Right? Yeah. Yeah, because otherwise they could just change it like on that day during your trial. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Not, you know, they could just say whatever they want and just that's it. But if it's a written law and it's known in advance that this is the basis of the proceeding, then that that gives some more uh, uh, legitimacy and and also assurance to the process. And so God, God, you know, in reaction to the crisis of sin, God gave a written form of His law. That that is the foundation of His His system of justice. Um, but. The law was there before he it was in writing, because the one who is the law it was there before it was in writing. And where we really need it again is like Sister D told us is written in the heart. She noted correctly that it was the Holy Spirit, but it's also we could think of it as. How did God write the, the law on the tables of stone? With his finger. With his own finger. With his own finger. Okay. And so how is God going to write that same law on the stony tables of our heart? With, with that same finger. <laughs> finger of God. Didn't even... Uh, uh, Pharaoh's sorcerers acknowledged when they saw the finger of God in the plagues. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a work that only God can do. But that's what he promises to do. Of course, we, we've talked about this before, but it's a, a beautiful symbolism in how God gave the commandments. He just, he just gave them to Moses, right, in the mount. God had God actually had made the stony tables. Mm -hmm. Moses didn't make the first table. God did. God wrote it with his own finger and he just gave it to him. He said, give this to the people. By, by the way, if, if the law is supposed to be written on our heart, when God gave us those tables, what was he really giving us? A new heart. Yes, he was giving us his heart. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Wasn't that what he was really giving? He was giving us his heart. Is it significant if you give somebody their your heart? Yes. That's a that's a that's a marriage proposal. That's a love affair. Give somebody your heart. But we have to be willing to accept it though. <laughs> oh. And that's all they had to do was accept it. But did they accept it? No. What happened? What happened to those first two tables of stone? They were broken. 
Moses broke them because of the people were acting really stupid and, and he broke them. Which was symbolic that they had broken the covenant that mm -hmm. was represented by what was written on those tables of stone, right? Mm -hmm. But really, what did those tables of stone represent? Their hearts. Well, in a sense, that's true. But again, it was a, symbolically, it was supposed to represent God's heart. We we broke God's heart. Okay. He gave us his heart, and then we broke his heart. And how does God respond? Uh, does he get? Does he have? Does he go crazy and go go postal and? Uh, no, no. Start start posting nasty things on social social media about us. No, no. he has a loving heart. Oh, he responded with the love that that he is. He couldn't respond mm -hmm. any other way except with love, because he is love. So he, he he's going to show us his love even more. The cross. An even greater revelation of his love. By the way, how did Jesus die on that cross? What was the actual uh, uh, diagnosis of, of what caused death? According to scripture, he died of a broken heart. Mm -hmm. I was thinking when the when the pierce, when the sword went into his heart and the blood and the water came out of his side, yeah. Yes. When the blood and the water came out, that means that his, his heart literally burst in his chest cavity. Yeah. And that's, that's why the blood and, the, and the, the serum that's clear separated and came out as two separate streams. Because he literally died of a broken heart crushed out by our sin. Again, showing us his... And actually, at the same time, again, giving us that same law, his same heart. Because he actually showed what the law really meant. When he was up on that cross, that's what the law really means. Going all the way, that, that much. That's what God's law means going all the way to sacrifice self for others, willingly, voluntarily. So he gave us his heart again, even though we broke it. That's his promise to write his law on our hearts again. That's what made it possible for him to write his law on our hearts again. The cross. But where did the second tables of stone come from? Did God make those? Yeah. Sorry, what was that question again? Where did the second tables of stone come from? The replacement. The second table. Oh, that came from the earth. That's right. Moses had to bring stones up with him the second time. That's right. God commanded okay. Moses to make two more tables of stone like the first and bring them to him. And he would write the same words on the tables. That's Exodus 34, maybe. We should look at that. Um, <clears throat> Exodus 34, yeah. Uh, yes. Verse 1, and the Lord said to Moses, yeah, hew these two tables of stone, hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first, and I will write upon these tables the words that were in the first tables, which thou breakest. So why did God make the first set of tables of stone, but the second time he told Moses to make them? 
and to bring them to God, even though he was writing the same words both times. Why the difference? Well, because the people trampled upon the law the first time, and it was commemorative of the fact that we broke the law. We broke the command. We break the commandments. They broke the commandments by their lack of faith and their actions. And they chose to walk without God, so it was kind of like the stone from the earth was commemorative of our own strength, which fails at a certain point. What, what do the tables of stone represent again, by the way? Now, didn't God, the first one, God gave the stones. So that was his heart he was giving to us. So when Moses gave the, made the stones, we were supposed to be giving our hearts to him, weren't we? Ah, yes. Second Corinthians 3.3 3 tells us that connects the tables of stone with the tables of the heart. The fleshy tables of yeah. the heart. So God wants to write his law again on our hearts, like he did in the beginning. But in order for him to do that, we have to bring our hearts to him. He can't just do it like he did the first time. The first time he just did it. But then we broke his heart starting with our first parents and all the rest of us ever since. Break his heart with our sin. And yet he gives us a greater revelation of himself in the cross, of his love, of his law. He says, marry me again. Bring me your heart now, willingly. And I will write the same law the same words on the tables of your heart as it was on, written on the first table. That's his promise. That's how he does it. But it requires our cooperation. It requires our willing consent. And it's Christ who's the one who's doing the writing. It's his finger that writes on our heart. That's the foundation of God's government. Tells us, tells us for instance, in Matthew 25, and verse 34, Jesus was telling uh, the parable of the sheep and the goats. And he it says in verse 34, Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So the kingdom, that's the government of God. And it's been there from the foundation of the world. And there's a king. It's got a capital K here in, in my Bible. Because that king is God. That king is Christ, actually, is the king who is the one who separates the sheep from the goats, right? Mm -hmm. Didn't, didn't the Father, didn't Christ say, my Father has given all judgment unto the Son? Yeah. Yes. So it's the Son who does the judging. By the way, and he does it as king. Because the king is the judge, the king is the lawgiver, the king is uh, uh, the one who saves us. He's the one doing this work, and there's a kingdom, a government that, and it's based on the found. It's been there since the foundation of the world. By the way, there's a, a lamb slain from the foundation of the world, right? In Revelation. Mm -hmm. So you have the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. You 
And then, of course, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 11, it tells us, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. The scriptures are clear that the foundation is, is Christ. But yes, his, he rests his government on, on his character, which is seen most clearly in the law being a transcript of that character. But Christ himself is the foundation. And of course, it tells us in Ephesians 2.20, a, a, a similar uh, uh, metaphor, as it were, in the building of the temple, and ye are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So here, still, Christ is the chief, and he's the cornerstone of the foundation. Which, of course, we are built upon. In whom we are building fitly framed together, groweth unto an holy temple to the Lord. It's a habitation of God through the Spirit. Getting into that connection of God writing with his finger on our heart and the work of the Spirit. That we saw. Now. In Revelation 13, 8, that's where we have the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. That revelation of his law, his love, in his willing sacrifice of self. Um, of course, Isaiah, speaking of the chief cornerstone, Isaiah 28, 16 Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Interesting. Then he goes on to talk about uh, judgment. Judgment also will I lay to the line and righteousness to the plummet. making clear that the foundation is stone is Christ. Uh, interestingly, connected with this foundation in 2 Timothy 2, 19, nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Notice the seal of God here, connected to the foundation. This is about an intimate knowledge with God. The Lord knoweth them that are his. Those who are entering into the marriage, who are willingly submitting and becoming part of the bride, Who letting the Lord have his way. The sealing work is connected to the foundation because it's Christ. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. It's there at the foundation. He's the one completing the final sealing process. Um, as we consider this idea, just wrapping up, of law, how the law is the foundation of God's government. Wh which law is the foundation of God's government? When you say which, aren't all of them? Wow. The Ten Commandments. 
Okay. The Ten Commandments are the foundation of God's government. Well, I, I would say we could probably say it most simply, God's law is the foundation of God's government. God's law, yeah. Okay. <laughs> As opposed, because there are other laws, are there not? Other than God's law? Well, the Ten Command, the civil laws were based on the Ten Commandments. They're more of a, uh, should I say, a more, uh, what's the word I want to use? When we go from the Ten Commandments to the civil laws in Exodus 21. I, I personally believe that all of the civil laws are perfectly in harmony with the moral law, so that I don't see a huge yeah, distinction from my perspective. Yeah. I might add that that's unlike that's feeble feeble humans, sorry, I might like add that unlike feeble humans, God is also subjected to His own law as well. Okay, so there's a difference between God's law and man's law. Much. Yes. yes. Okay. How so? What's the difference? Well. God's law is truth and right, and man's law man, is... Man's law is derived from God's law with all our human... With all our human... All right, me, then, then D, then, then Chris, then, then D. You're half Chris, duplex, D. So hold, yeah. please. Uh, man's law is a derivative of God's law with all our human imperfections. Chris? No, I just want to say God's law is truth. Okay. Amen. Sister D? Well, I was going to say God's law is truth and the man's man's law, in, at least in the Old Testament times, was more in harmony with that truth, but still only a shadow of because it was still laws that were devised by Moses more himself based on the Ten Commandments. But they were written by man. Okay. I think more so now than then because... Um, you know, obviously the civil law, the civil laws weren't written in stone, but they well, were based. They were working in conjunction with things that man had already devised. For instance, okay, man had devised slavery. God didn't devise slavery. That came after the fallen world, after the entrance of sin. But God worked in conjunction with man to compromise and say well instead of abolishing slavery altogether he set out how we should treat our masters and how masters should treat their servants then within that context but it was still the context of man okay well let me ask this question uh, what's the source of God's law or where did it come from what's it derived from Love. From. Okay. What God else? himself. God himself. Okay. Oh. I, I like both of those answers because they're both correct. It, it was from him. It was it's it, it, it was showing forth and, and as creator is is God the source of all reality? Yes. Is there anything yeah. that's actually real that God is not the source of? No. 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 Everything that's truly real, that's lasting, comes from God. And so when he gave us his law, he was giving us principles of reality. They weren't arbitrary. Yeah. It wasn't just certain laws, and you, if you follow my laws, and I'll, or I'll zap you, and you obey my laws, and then I'll you know, like you, but keep my eye on you. No, no. He was so actually re revealing to us the basis of reality and life, of love. 
Yeah, but he he was working with. I mean, reality was. Like, for instance, okay, say slavery is part of reality that was devised after we began living in a fallen world. Um, reality, God's law is based on reality. So, and so, that's not real, actually. It might what's seem not real. real? Slavery. It might seem real to us. Slavery is not the, the thing, real. The, thing, the things of this world actually aren't real. They're... They seem uh, real. Okay. They have. A, they have. A, they're part of our experience of reality, but in the sense that they're not eternal, they're not really real. Yeah. It's, okay. They're that, not wait, eternal. Wait, say that, Slavery. Say that one more time, brother. The idea of one created being enslaving another created being comes out of the mind of a created being, and it's a. It's a. Right. It's a selfish, sinful As thought. As opposed to. And it's not going to last. It's going right. to in be that eliminated. Sense, it's in that real. sense, in that you're sense, right. It's not real. But, in that sense, you're right. But the person who's going through slavery, you can't tell them that it's not physically real to them. That's not what I'm saying. It's not. And I'm, and I'm not talking. No, to I know. Them. I know. I'm, I'm not I talking know. about yeah. that. But in, we're talking at okay. the level that we're going to try to acknowledge what's actually real. Everything yeah, yeah. else, everything that isn't connected with God is actually not real. It's, it's God has created temporary circumstances where he allows it to exist, even though it shouldn't exist. Everything, right, it's connected, not, everything it's, connected with sin should have ceased to exist the moment it existed. But God, right, in right. mercy, temporarily well, cut that, out that dying process. Had and, that been the case, we wouldn't be here. That's right. And... We create, right. we, we all create a false reality in our mind. It's like because I it's see sin. it in my mind, but it doesn't come out the same way when I try to say it. I hear what you're saying makes absolute sense, but my, my learning disabilities don't allow me to, That's all right. to say well, it the way it needs to be said when words are so important to everyone else. I'm trying and they're to They're important help us. to me, too. But I, Amen. Yeah. I'm trying to help You're us with understand. You're what loves you, so we understand. So yeah, yeah, yeah. The real things come from God, and they are everlasting. That's what He gave us in His law. Yeah. That's what He gave us when He gave us His heart. Those are the everlasting things, and all the temporary. Everything else it, isn't really real. Yeah. So when I when I when I think of the the laws of man, even in harmony even the laws that were in harmony with the Ten Commandments, the laws of man were still written by created beings. The laws of Moses were somehow were different than the Ten Commandments, obviously, because Moses okay. wrote those laws for the people inspired by the Ten Commandments, but he had to take into consideration all of those things that were not eternal. How yes, to but, act but, within but, the context of things that aren't eternal. But I, I don't think that those laws came out of the mind of Moses. They were the mind of, of God. That's because it's the word of God. Though, yes, God's dealing with things that aren't eternal, that aren't real. But he has to deal with right. them. Because, right, because right. He has to deal with them, yeah. The point of contrast that I'm trying to make is God's law is based on reality, real mm -hmm. things, real, that, reality. that are everlasting, while man's law right. actually comes out of the imagination of man, and it's not real. No. We're, trying to create, right. we're trying to create a reality in harmony with our selfish yeah. desires, right? and it's actually not real. And, yeah, and yet we, we are admonished in Romans chapter 13 to obey the laws of the land. Yes. But I mean, I'm not, just try to follow along with the thinking. So, so God, right, man, right. man is trying to to create this false reality, and and we have this. You know, sometimes people talk about how God's going to come and He's going to crush all the other kingdoms of the world and He's going to reign. No, the kingdoms of this world are all going all fall apart because they're mm -hmm. all based right. on on man's thinking. Yeah, it's not real. <clears throat> As depicted with the barley loaf in Daniel chapter two, yes. the stone that 
that crushed out that that um, caused all the other kingdoms to fall apart at the end of the fourth kingdom. Yeah. Can I ask a strange question? Is I take this way I mean it. It sounds strange. Is this all sort of like a strange fantasy? The Earth and godly people are just part of this dream, so to speak, and we're going home, and everything on Earth is is just a mirage. Is I mean because nothing, nothing on Earth is real, except what God, except God and Jesus. And everything that we're doing is is not part of God. The whole earth is a mirage, something that's not. It's a, I believe the, the scriptures call it a, a strong delusion. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And it's just going to fade away. And we're just sort of living in this delusion. And we're just waiting for Jesus to come so we can go home because nothing is real. Oh, my goodness. Our brother was right. We are living in the Matrix. Oh, my goodness. Well. <laughs> no, we're not. <laughs> it was just, it, it's um, a, it's our, experiences, our experiences are very real, but... No, but I know what you mean. God, God, God but our reality, nice our reality is not eternal. Our reality is not eternal, and from that point of view, I think what you're trying to say, yes. Brother Craig, is from that point of view, it's not real. That's right. So okay, yeah. Is. Now, now I think I understand. Yeah, just decide. God is real, saying. but everything else is just. <laughs> thank, thank the Lord. Our reality is not eternal. Amen. Uh, I still, I still would be really uh, uh, careful with this word, because um, though we understand it, people around us may not understand oh. it. Mm. I would Can say I like so maybe, words. maybe it would be easier to stuff. say it is his reality and our reality. Mm. And uh, right. his reality is the true one. And our re right, reality exactly. is the Im imagined one. Mm -hmm. And uh -huh. perverted. We basically, we basically took his reality and perverted it. Yes. Because we cannot Created exist... We, we still exist in God. We still exist by God. But we take it and we, we pervert it. And we say, oh, this is the true reality. Look then, at us. And then we act on it. And in every way we can, we use our God-given abilities to try to make that imagined reality actually real. But it, yes. it can never yes. actually work in the end. If yeah. it's if it's keeping if it's excluding Christ, it will always fail and fall apart. <clears throat> yeah, that's what I'm saying. Um, I, I just um, would say we should be careful with the words. His reality and our reality would be much more convenient for people's minds. Okay. You know. mm -hmm. And also, yeah. we cannot exist without God. And uh, exactly. for me, for me, the most uh, awful thing is that he allows us to take his reality and pervert it. That's a torture for him. We're torturing yep. him with uh, taking the breath of life, uh, the energy of life, the, the material things he created, and we mm -hmm. just... Uh, do bad things with that and we call that good and the, the lord should suffer the creator should suffer uh, waiting when we uh, turn towards his reality and start calling his reality good and 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 well i'll speak for myself i have the unmitigated gall to pinch myself and say, oh, my goodness, I hope this isn't real when I created it through my sin. You know, th th there's a word in the Hebrew language that expresses the idea of, of th this idea of true reality as opposed to everything that we see around us. But there being a, a, an eternal reality connected with God. You know what that word is? It's the word amen. <laughs> amen. 
Amen. Literally, that's what it means. But when you say amen, you're acknowledging the reality that you can only see by faith, but that is actually yeah. eternally real, as opposed to the reality that you see around us, but that's temporary and not going to last. And you say your response, right. when you acknowledge that unseen reality, you say amen. Amen. And that's literally the word in Hebrew that has, it, it means this idea of, of having faith in an unseen reality. Mm -hmm. That's actually more real than the, re the reality that I can see. Yes, Brother Dan. Uh -huh. I just was thinking, as I tried to phrase that a while ago, it's amazing how I can say, God, you gave me this world. I misused the world. And now I hurt, and I'm blaming you for it. <laughs> you know, it doesn't make any sense at all. I've been having this dream over and over again about a wrinkled earth. A wrinkled earth? Yeah. Let's we'll, we'll hold off on that thought. You can tell us after we're done praying. Um, oh, okay. Uh, any last thoughts on the study before we pray? Uh, here, uh, Heavenly Father, our most holy creator God, we thank you so much, dear Lord, for this precious time that you give us each week uh, uh, to welcome in your Sabbath uh, with hearing your word speaking to our hearts, Lord. Help us to see you. Help us to, to indeed uh, reverence and, and desire your law, Lord, but because we love you, because of our relationship with you, that we, that we recognize that you are the, the true substance that we need, that can give us, that you alone can actually write your law on the tables, the stony tables of our heart, and give us hearts of flesh instead of hearts of stone. And uh, please continue to, to knit our hearts together in love, that we might be your witnesses, and keep and preserve us until we can meet again as our prayer. May it be in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.